Is the radiation emitted by cell phone towers safe for human beings or anything biological? That's the answer we're going to answer today on Smart Attack. My name is Nick Diem of Guy Pino. I'm the host here and the author of the 2017 Non Tin Foil Guide to EMFs. That's a question I answered in my guide when I originally published it, but today I'm going to review the latest science on the topic and show you why most of what you see online that is dismissive towards these potential hazard is, well, how can I put it? Completely wrong. So let's dive into my research here. And I prepared a few slides. We're going to share this with you right here. So the first thing I want to show you is just a, a comment I saw on Instagram, uh, total misinformation. And of course, it was on a video that talks about the dangers of something called radio frequency radiation, which is the type of radiation emitted by your cell phone, the cell phone you might be using to watch this very video on, or a laptop, or even a cell phone tower that connects uh, your cell phone to the cellular network. And the person here says total misinformation iPhones may affect mental health, but their lower frequency or longer wavelengths means they cannot directly damage DNA and cause cancer. So it's nothing against Jeffrey. It could be anyone really. And most people think that. And I ask myself, okay, what? why do most people still think that? That there's no link with cancer, there's no link with uh, DNA damage or any of these problems. Well, if you look at the American Cancer Society and you look at what are they saying on RF, which is radio frequency waves or radio frequency radiation? American Cancer Society says there's no strong evidence that exposure to RF waves can cause any noticeable health effects. Well, however, it does not mean that the cell phone towers and the RF waves they emit are absolutely safe. So they re they, they're fair in their assessment. However, no strong evidence. I'm going to uh, show you that this is simply not the case. And then she thought they, they do talk about what expert agencies say in the US, of course. Uh, they don't have an official uh, position, the American Cancer Society, that is, but they cite two different agencies the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the WHO, World Health Organization. I'm not a big fan of uh, World Health Organization because of their conflict of interest and in many things. However, IARC has been doing, a, let's say, a relatively okay job uh, looking at different uh, carcinogens or potential carcinogens. Then there's something called the US National Toxicology Program, NT which is form of different agencies, including FDA, CDC, and NIH. And they are a branch, uh, again, focused on toxicology to find what agents might be potential problems. So let's look at what these agencies found, because again, the American Cancer Society says, well, we don't have any official position or statement, and we're not doing the research. These guys are. Okay, let's look at what they found. IARC. International Agency for Research on Cancer, May 31st, 2011. That's uh, almost 15 years ago at this point. They found that radio frequency electromagnetic fields, such as the ones emitted by cell towers, are possibly carcinogenic to humans, group 2B. What they cite in there, I'm not going to go through all documents or else this video will take, you know, a couple hours, but uh, everything will be linked in the video below and uh, on the show notes on my website. If you want to go through all the documents, of course, please do. Uh, what they found is that it's a potential carcinogen to humans, group 2B, which is a low classification. Uh, however, it lacked animal data not enough large animal studies and uh, toxicology studies. We have this animal data now. It's been since 2018, and Dr. Anthony Miller is an epidemiologist, so they, um, they study basically populations and disease and try to find a correlation, if not a causation, between what different exposures might be doing to the population. Cancer epidemiology update following the 2011 decision. So what they say here, these scientists, uh, Miller and colleagues, they say that 
when we consider recent animal experimental evidence, I'm going to show you what they're talking about. The recent studies strengthen and support the conclusion that RFR, that's radio frequency radiation, should be categorized as IARC group one. So what they say, in other words, is that this classification in 2011 should now be upgraded or reviewed again to group one. That means that radio frequency radiation emitted by cell phones or cell towers, for that matter, is should be reclassified next to asbestos and tobacco as a definite carcinogen. IARC has been asked again for a second time to review the risk cancer from RF. This is microwave news, excellent journalism on EMFs for decades at this point. And basically, they say, well, you know, is the second time that radio frequency radiation is one of about 100 agents listed at high priority by IARC here, an international agency for research on cancer, for evaluation over the next five years. It's going to take a long time. And we simply don't know why the re-evaluation of this agent has never been done. It's very vague, and uh, maybe we'll learn a little bit more about it. Some talk about potential uh, industry involvement in making sure that we're not reviewing the RF cancer risk. This is speculation on my part, but we know that the industry has always uh, a lot of influence on various agencies, and that's a uh, regulatory capture for you and what it does to this world. Let's go back in 1999 because we talked here about the U.S. National Toxicology Program, and part of it is uh, from the Food and Drug Administration. Well, the Food and Drug Administration nominated the agent called radio frequency radiation emissions of wireless communication devices in 1999. What does this mean? Basically, they nominated this agent so that the National Toxicology Program can study its effects. And what they said, you can go through the entire document. Why, why did they say we need to study it? Well, they said a couple of things that, of course, they said it is not scientifically possible to warranty that those non-thermal levels of microwave radiation, what do they mean? It, they mean low levels where it's not heating your tissue, but it's not guarantee it will not cause long-term adverse effects. And you'll see that our safety standards that are supposed to be protective are based on short-term effects. But now we're talking about long-term adverse effects. And this is in 1999, the FDA had prepared documentation around 1995 or even 94 about this agent and said, mm, now we absolutely need to urgently study it. It took a couple of years here, <laughs> a couple of years later in 2018. I'm just kidding. It's two decades later. We have the National Toxicology Program with the final animal study and the final results, clear evidence of cancer. So basically what happened is that they studied it for several years on uh, studied the effects of radio frequency radiation, long-term exposure on rats and mice. And basically who the person who led the design of the NTP study uh, and has been a scientist at the NTP for 28 years said an important lesson should be learned is that we can no longer assume any current or future wireless technology is safe. So some people dismissed this study, um, including, including here, the FDA itself. Remember that the FDA in 99 said we should study this agent to make sure it's safe. But the director of the FDA in 2018 said, well, these findings should not be applied to human cell phone usage, which is complete fabrication uh, or uh, you know fabulation at this point because this is the gold standard of toxicology which is studying rats and mice and not humans and what they found is the highest possible level of evidence which is clear evidence of cancer in animals so 
I don't know how they were able to just deny it, but I guess uh, that's what you do in PR when you don't know what to say or when you want to save face. But basically, even if uh, Dr. Jeffrey Shuren says everything is fine, even IR said it's a possible human carcinogen, but we know that it should be reclassified as a class one carcinogen uh, given the same criteria as the 2011 decision. But what happens after this? US NTP quits RF. So the promise studies that were supposed to be done after 2018 by the NTP were not done. Why? We don't know. So we we all we know here from Microwave News is that the program seems to have stopped for some reason. We were supposed to get a few follow-up studies that would help support the conclusions or deny them, but we never did. So we don't know what happened. But at this point, what scientists are saying is that the US is essentially using zero dollars per year or funding this line of research with zero dollars per year. Now we have, uh, I'm gonna try to refresh here. We have another um, mainstream person NIH, let's look at one of the top U.S. environmental scientists who left the NIH now. And she's been leading the NIH, uh, one of the top slots for one decade. And she, she says, now I'm retired, I can be truthful, and uh, I'm looking forward to be able to speak out because there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff happening and it's, and it, and it's hard. What is she seeing now? The same person, Dr. Linda uh, Birnbaum. She, she says things like, Dr. Uh, Linda Birnbaum never puts her cell phone to her head, installed her Wi-Fi router as far away as possible from her bedroom, and would never want to live close to a cell phone tower. This is one of the top people at NIH. I never would want to live ne near a cell phone tower. Then we have this group of scientists um, formed around three years ago called the International Commission on the Biological Effects of EMFs, uh, ICBE EMF. Incredible consortium of international scientists. You see Anthony Miller here that we talked about and a few others like Dr. Ronald uh, Melnick who designed uh, this NTP uh, study or who was part of the team that designed it. And what do they say? They say, well, we don't have the right safety limits. These limits were based on results from behavioral studies conducted in the 1980s, so very deprecated, and involving short exposures in five monkeys and eight rats. So they say, well, it doesn't work. You know, the general population is not protected short term and long term from these limits. So we cannot trust the limits. That's why you have a top scientist that's that's saying, well, I would never want to live to a clo close to a cell tower because it's too risky. Let's look at the good article by Trial Site News saying, well, current radio frequency radiation exposures are based on inadequate science. Does 5G, including 5G cell towers here, introduce heightened health concerns? I would say, you know, we already had concerns, but 5G just adds more to the mix. And basically what they say here, and we don't have the, the full article, but they say, should the ICBE be correct, why would governments be consoled, <laughs> concerned with global warming, but not as well the prospect of heightened risk for health human catastrophe powered by industry in the case of EMFs? Obviously, more research is needed, but this group of scientists, highly credentialed, should be taken seriously. And basically, they talk about a technological train wreck that we are going through. I agree with that. Early studies specifically on cell phone towers, because I've just demonstrated that safety studies have essentially never been done. And the safety studies that uh, have been done more, more recently show evidence of long-term cancer. So we can say that whether it's cell phone exposure or cell tower exposure, we're probably in, in trouble. But there's other things than cancer 
in life, right? Not catching cancer is not necessarily my definition of good health. Uh, instead, I would like to feel good and to live a long and healthy life. So we have something called electrohypersensitivity or uh, also called by Dr. Magda Havis, rapid aging syndrome, where the closer people live to a transmitter, a cell phone tower, the more symptoms they experience. This is based on the work of Santini and Al, which is which has been published in the early 2000s. So the closer you are to cell towers, there's a strong correlation with certain symptoms. It's not causation, but it's part of the evidence that will lead us to conclude that cell towers are not something you want very close to your bedroom. And we have different symptoms, including fatigue, uh, sleep disturbance, headaches, feeling of discomfort, difficulty concentrating, depression, memory loss, etc. Hey, let me interrupt this podcast for a second. I need to tell you about one of the EMF protection or health supporting tools that I really believe in and which help finance the costs of this show. One of the most common questions I've received in the last few years of this work as the EMF guy is what EMF meter should I buy? out of all these options on the market. There are a lot of good meters out there with prices ranging from a few hundred dollars to a few thousands, but the number one meter that I think complete beginners should consider using is called the Sam Protec 33. This is the exact meter Brian Hoyer and I recommend to our members inside the Electropollution Fix course. This meter can measure three different types of EMFs at the same time, which is a very rare feature. The readings are very accurate for the price you pay, which is uh, uh, in the range of um, almost around $200. So there's also a sound feature for the wireless setting and also a triple axis magnetic field reader, which tells you that the magnetic field readings will be precise. So if you want to check out the SEM Protect 33, simply visit theemfguy.com slash shop. Okay, now back to the podcast. Let's look at a review. This is old science, if we want, from over two decades ago. This is more recent, 2022, review by Balmori. Evidence for a health risk by RF, radiofrequency radiation, on humans living around mobile phone base stations. Another word for cell phone towers. He found that all the studies, the, basically the studies that did not make, uh, meet strict conditions have uh, provided supplementary evidence, but they were not included. So considering all the, the studies reviewed globally, only 38 have been published. So that's not nearly enough, but what we have so far, we have 74% showing effects for radio frequency sickness, which is similar as what we talked about here, electro hypersensitivity or EMF related symptoms. And we have, 77% uh, for cancer and 75% of them for biochemical parameters. Interesting is the conclusion by uh, Alfonso Balmori here, which is a, a stellar scientist. He said that in the current circumstances, it seems that the scientific experts in the field are very clear about the serious problems we are facing and have expressed this through important appeals. However, the media, the responsible organizations such as the WHO and the governments are not transmitting this crucial information to, to the population who remain uninformed. For these reasons, the current situation will probably end in a crisis, not only for health, but also for technology itself, as, as it is unsustainable and harmful to the environment and the people. Then we have even more evidence a few weeks before I researched for this episode. We have senior scientists in Europe reporting that people living near cell phone towers show significant changes in their genetic makeup. Uh, these people are highly credentialed and um, the study is small but provocative. So we still have ongoing um, proof that is being um, or evidence that is being put forward by scientists. So these uh, scientists are saying that you know, the closer you are to cell phone towers, the more you have cumulative low level effects and not just cancer, but DNA damage. And that can lead to 
basically anything bad when it comes to your health. We have another scientist that has been publishing quite a lot on this, and I'm almost I'm almost done here, so I'll, I'll go through it quickly. But just talking about one scientist because it's important for me. Uh, let me let me just uh, close the video for a second and stop sharing. It's important for me to provide relatively mainstream sources. And the reason I do this is that a lot of skeptics are watching these videos or maybe you want to share them with family and friends. And uh, there is information on the internet and from random people, me included. I'm just a citizen journalist, you know, showing you some of the sources I look at and letting you uh, make up your own mind here. But it's important for me to show you that certain scientists that are considered relatively mainstream in toxicology uh, have emitted these the same um, concerns towards EMFs. It's not just random internet information. It's in fact relatively uh, mainstream science at this point. Prof Hardell is uh, an MD PhD from Sweden, specialist in oncology, cancer epidemiologist at uh, Orebro University. I'm probably butchering this. Long career, he identified uh, the cancer classification as uh, TCDD, PCB, the herbicide glyphosate. Um, and uh, I know there's also Agent Orange and then radio frequency fields. So he's also publishing when it comes to EMFs. He said this in uh, 2004, I think. Hold on, let me, there you go. 2004, he said, is there historical evidence for the precautionary principle in cancer prevention? He said this, well, the authorities are not taking EMF seriously. So this team um, has been attacked by industry over different studies, but eventually, he, were, he was able to uh, have this uh, TCDD classified as agent, uh, a human carcinogen group one. So his work contributed to the, right, the righteous uh, classification of uh, a carcinogen as a carcinogen. That's very important. But now he says in 2004, two decades ago, that the lessons of the history seem to go unheeded as exemplified by the by the case of cellular phones. So two decades ago, he was already saying there's so much industry pressure that our warnings about cancer prevention are not being heard. And so far, they have barely been heard because two decades later, Hardell with journalist Mona Nielsen has been uh, publishing a series of case reports. There's eight of them, if I recall correctly, but here's a summary of seven of them. When it comes to the microwave syndrome, again, all these terms are similar, electrosensitivity, microwave syndrome. You had uh, Balmori that talked about uh, here, the radio frequency uh, sickness, which is all similar. EMF, we can talk about EMF related symptoms. So he says that he has been studying people who in all cases develop the microwave syndrome. So a bunch of symptoms of ill health within a short time after being exposed to 5G base stations. They took measurements in all cases, the high radio frequency radiation from 4G or 5G antennas was measured and the radiation reached 2.5 million to 3 million microwatts per square meter. It's still within the safety limits, but they argue that it's too much because you, you had different symptoms such as difficulty sleeping, headache, fatigue, irritability, concentration problem, uh, memory problem, emotional distress, depression, anxiety. And it kind of reminds me that study we talked about from two decades ago, if I can find it here. These are similar symptoms, and we know that these symptoms are increasing overall, might not be solely caused by radio frequency radiation. However, it's one of the environmental stressors that is the most often ignored. So these case studies are only reinforcing the idea that if you install 5G or 4G or any generation of cell tower too close to people, they don't feel good.
Then we have Dr. Ken Chamberlain, who's part of this ICBE EMF group I told you about. He's a PhD, Ohio uh, University. He's a past chair and professor emeritus um, Department of Electrical Computer Engineering, uh, University of uh, New Hampshire. And he served on a commission uh, on 5G in 2019 and 2020. And this commission was convened to evaluate how do we respond to the rollout of 5G and what risks are there. What he said in uh, this document about his final report in 2021, he said, we should be at least 500 meters from residences. And uh, he cited some examples of uh, different schools that are that have a certain setback uh, where there's a minimum distance between a certain tower and schools. He said about 500 meters, which is 1,500 feet, should be a safer proposition than living right next to it. And there are some examples of countries that have already uh, push this. In 2012, that's over a decade ago at this point, you had a court ruling from the Rajasthan High Court uh, in uh, India, which is the most, um, uh, one of the largest provinces in India. And they said that now the towers should be shifted at least 500 meters from jails. And it was to uh, just citing harmful electromagnetic radiation. But also, there there were, there, there were recommendations or mandates on placing cell phone towers too close to playgrounds, hospitals, schools, and they included jails as well. And maybe there were specific concerns around cancer in cancers in jail. But overall, it looks like 1,500 feet or 500 meters from a cell phone tower might be a safer um, way to uh, be exposed to a, a cell phone tower. We don't know at this point what is the quote-unquote safe distance because all we know is that the current safety standards are not protecting us. So we don't know what the safe dose of this radiation is. If you want to look at how close you might live to a cell phone tower, you can go to antennasearch.com and enter your address. And you're going to see antennas, towers. It gets a little bit scary. Uh, I, won't, I won't lie. But at the same time, if you want to be informed, go go with it uh there's uh, the possibility if you find yourself too close to a cell phone tower there are various shielding strategies that can be applied some of them i addressed on this podcast before but they're more advanced and normally will require the help of a building biologist or an emf consultant uh one that is my immediate colleague co-author on many courses and different things uh, i have been publishing in the last years is brian hoyer and his team from Shielded Healing. And there's also the Building Biology Institute in the US and also various other institutes around the world that can help you um, basically come to your home, do an EMF survey and find out if those cell phone towers are exposing you too much, especially in your bedroom at night. But overall, when you stay home, are you overexposed to this radio frequency radiation? And if that's the case, uh, some people move away, but in certain situations, you can shield your environment and make it much, much, much safer, dampening the levels of exposure. So I hope this video was useful. It's not good news, to be quite honest, because I know that the cell towers are scary. There are a few things we can do about cell towers. We can become an activist for safer technologies, but that's a long-term game. We can move away in the countryside or not be too close to the towers. Very difficult to achieve for a lot of people. We can shield against the cell tower radiation, uh, starting by also cleaning up your own home making sure that you turn off Wi-Fi at night or discourage the use of Wi-Fi, turn off Wi-Fi inside your router and go wired. That These are all things I've been saying in my book, in my courses, and on my uh, YouTube channel slash podcast for years. And I'll still continue to educate you about the many things you can control when it comes to these exposures. When it comes to radio frequency radiation from cell towers, it's a little bit trickier to mitigate against, but some things can still be done. So please share this video as much as you can. I hope it was useful and I'll see you in the next episode of Smarter Tech. Goodbye.
In case this wasn't already obvious, the information provided in this podcast is not intended to replace medical advice. We always recommend that you review this information with a functional medicine practitioner or environmental medicine doctor who is up to date with the latest information on the dangers of EMFs and the best practices around electro hypersensitivity, just to name these two things. And if you want to support my work, please consider sharing this episode with people you care about. You can also also invest in my book, courses, or recommended products found at theemfguy.com. Thank you.